How would you like more power in your life? I'm here today to tell you how you can get more power. I'm sure everyone here can use some more power in their lives. So I'm going to tell you how I got more power, and hopefully that will be useful to you. John Hall once said that something, something to the effect that if someone was going to get up into the pulpit, they should talk about how they found God. That made a lot of sense to me, so that's where I'm going to begin. My father was a divorced Catholic. As a result, he didn't feel that he belonged to a church, but he was a strong believer. My mother was Protestant. My mother was a believer. It was my mother that taught me how to pray. We rarely went to church, but I can remember watching Norman Vincent Peale on television with her. My family got me started in being a believer. When I was 19 years old, my father was on his deathbed. I didn't know it at the time, but I should have figured it out. He was smoking camel straights for 40 years, and did trick work, and had a rheumatic heart. Uh, every day I would go into the hospital, and I would try and cheer him up, and I was usually able to get him to smile. Um, making my father smile was one of the reasons I think I developed a jovial personality, and I felt great about being able to make him feel better. And one night after we had a really upbeat visit, I sent up a prayer. And I said that as long as he could enjoy life and smile and appreciate it, he should stay with us. And when he could no longer appreciate life and enjoy it, it was time for him to go. The next night, try as I may, I couldn't get him to smile. He was just too uncomfortable. I knew when I left the room that night that he was going to die. And only several hours later, he passed. Initially, I felt responsible for my father dying. My, parent, my prayer had been a nail in his coffin. My mother helped me grieve. She helped me understand that I wasn't responsible for my father dying. She was open to me about her own grief. We would cry together. If you've ever cried with someone else, you know what a profound experience this is. She gave me permission to grieve, not knowing how much I would need it. From that day forward, I have been a believer in God and prayer. Six years later, I was 26 years old, going on 13 emotionally. Um, my mother was killed. The pain was incredible. I didn't expect it. It took me totally by surprise, and it literally cut through me like a knife. Some nights I would cry a million tears, other nights I would figure out every trick in the book to keep from crying. But she gave me permission to grieve, and I did. I mourned her. One of the first quotes I memorized from the Bible was, Blessed are those that mourn, for they should be comforted. I knew that if I mourned, God would literally help me tolerate the pain, and he did. That was the worst thing that happened to me, and probably the best, because while the pain was excruciating, it was kind of like being thrown in the deep end, not knowing how to swim. And I was 13 years old emotionally, and I had to learn how to swim all over again. It forced me to grow up. Over the next few years, I started a family and a career as a psychotherapist. I can't begin to tell you the number of times that the divine intervention would show me the path I intended to take. And one day, Kath said to me, my wife, she said, what would you like to do for your birthday? I said, well, you know, I would like to go see Norman Vincent Peale. She said, great, okay, let's do that. So on this stormy February morning, we got out to go to New York City. And I went out to start my car and it wouldn't start. Battery was dead, cold as anything. And I went inside and I said, I don't know if we can get there, we'll probably have to take your car. So we went out to leave and I said, I'll try my car one more time. So I turned it over and it started right up. We drove to New York City. We walked into Marble Collegiate Church, and this greeter came up and stuck his hand out to us and said, you here to get your battery recharged? <laughs> <laughs> and we knew we were in the right place. <laughs> we knew this was what we needed. My family went on, we grew, everything was going pretty well. But in 1997, I was only 46 years old, I began to have concerns about things changing in my body. Initially, the doctor just brushed it off, but he, 
I insisted that he go further, and after a physical and some tests, it was recommended I have a biopsy on my prostate. They were looking for cancer. I remember the night before the test. When things like this happen to you, you find yourself up at 2 or 3 in the morning talking to your higher power. And that night I was very directed to God. I told him how scared I was and that I was in trouble and I needed his help. And I told him I couldn't deal with symbols or clues. I needed a clear message of what was going to happen. <laughs> you know, sometimes the symbols just, you know, you don't know what they mean. <laughs> and so it's two in the morning and I hear this voice, clear as anything, I will take care of you, my son. Now I am the product of a scientific education. I think of myself as logical and being grounded in reality. I'm also an intelligent being with the ability to doubt. There are any number of reasons to, to, to doubt these words, but I'm also a person of a strong faith and I held on to these words. I went back to them routinely to gather strength and keep going. A couple of days later, I received a phone call from the doctor unceremoniously informing, that I, informing me that I had cancer and to let them know when I was ready to do something about it. I was shocked. We were shocked. I couldn't believe it. I went looking for a second opinion, hoping there would be another answer. I remember finally sitting with a doctor and asking him, is it possible that I got cancer through voodoo? <laughs> and he said, no, no, couldn't have gotten through voodoo. Well, do you know how I got it? No. Well, then maybe I got it through voodoo. <laughs> I didn't know, but he didn't either. I wasn't very sure what would happen. First, I had a radical prostatectomy. They removed the diseased tissue and eliminated the cancer. That made sense to me. That seemed like it made sense. Then several months later, the doctor apologetically told me, oops, we didn't get it all. That was a big oops. <laughs> then I had radiation treatment. I had 32 doses of some lethal radiation. I never totally believed in the radiation treatment. Wasn't surprised when several months later, the doctors would apologetically tell me, oops, we didn't get it all. By the year 2001, they were, had nothing left for, for me in their bags of tricks, and I knew I was in deep trouble. I decided that I was responsible for contracting the cancer, so it was my responsibility to eliminate it. For the next 14 years, I battled with the cancer in my own way. Catherine battled, with it, battled it right along with me. We used everything we had. I used my psychotherapy training. I talked to the cancer to ascertain what would defeat it. I changed my exercise regime. I changed my nutrition. I started meditating. I wasn't any good at it, but I tried. Importantly, I changed my perspective on life. A few weeks ago, this congregation sang the song, Live Like You Are Dying. I did just that. Every day became precious. I would approach each doctor visit confident that what I was doing would work. I fully believed that this time I would reverse, reverse the growth. With God's help, I should be able to defeat this, this challenge. <coughs> but doctor visit after doctor visit, I would be disappointed. The cancer kept growing, and I would get discouraged. By this point in my life, most of my questions were spiritual. I have spiritual counselors that I talk to. My clients are always asking me, do I go to therapy? And yeah, I go to my spiritual counselors routinely and ask them the questions that I, I can't ask anybody else. God wasn't healing me. I didn't understand why the cancer wasn't going away and it shook my faith. When I felt like I was failing, they would remind me that what I was doing was probably slowing it down. I was also told that I needed to let God be in control, not me. I would follow the advice, surrender, then take my will back. I was willing to let God be in charge, but only if he gave me the outcome I wanted. <laughs> I would surrender over and over, then try and dictate what was to happen. The, para the failures had a paradoxical, paradoxical effect on my spirituality. The more the cancer grew, the more I felt like I needed to get closer to God. My definition of God evolved. I began to understand God as an energy, energy which can neither be created or destroyed. Each of us has some of that divine spiritual energy within us. 
I finally became consistent in doing 15 minutes of prayer daily. I focused on allowing the energy to pass through me. Sometimes I would vis visualize God touching the cancer and it shriveling up. Sometimes I would visualize dozens of little white kittens cascading down from my shoulders to my core, eating up all the cancer cells. I included yoga in, in my meditation. The yoga, the meditation, which I call listening to God, and prayer, which I call talking to God, brought me closer. I started memorizing a growing list of biblical <coughs> quotes that I would repeat daily. For example, I am always with you, that is all you need. My power shows up best in weak people. Well, I knew I needed power, and I knew I was a weak people, so that one fit for me. And the one we repeated before, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, nothing shall be impossible unto you. I would literally visualize my mountain of cancer moving to yonder place. At different times, I would find new quotes that captured what I was dealing with at that time. I would add them to the list. Catherine always reminded me that if I hung around long enough, modern medicine would come up with new treatment for the cancer. Then in 2014, the cancer got out of the box. You must understand how cancer grows. First you have two cells, then you have four, then you have eight, then you have 16. The measure of how much cancer I had started climbing through the roof. At the same time, Hartford Hospital had teamed up with Slo Sloan Kettering, and they were trying a new treatment protocol. Because prostate cancer feeds on hormones, they gave me a hormone blocker, which would starve 95% of the cancer cells. They gave me chemotherapy at the same time. The chemotherapy was thought to kill the other 5% of the cells, and we started this new treatment in late October 2014. Before I started the chemo, I went to see Julia. She could see that I was resisting surrendering my will to God. I wanted him to do it, with my, but with my way and my time frame, I needed to surrender. Finally, during one of my meditations, I committed myself to God with a willingness to accept whatever he had in store for me. Then I heard a little voice that said, I want what you want. Again, could you believe what I heard? Could I believe it? Or was it just my anxious heart telling me what I want to hear? I can tell you that hearing that voice was quite a relief. I was prescribed two years of hormone treatment and six infusions of chemotherapy. Have you ever heard of body cleansings? You drink some body and it's supposed to clean out your body. You drink some product and it's supposed to clean out your body. There is no cleansing that compares to chemotherapy. It is as if they put Ajax directly into your bloodstream. The effect wouldn't happen immediately. However, I would get the infusion by Friday, and by Sunday I would be totally wiped out. The first week is always the worst. I, I feel really miserable by the second week, and by the third week I'd feel passable. Then it would start all over again. I felt miserable for most of the six months. I lost my hair and my strength. I lost my sensitivity in my fingertips. My body was sick for the entire six months. I would get up in the morning, take a shower, and even sit down. I would dress, and then I would have to sit down. But then I would go into my office, and I would sit there, and I would get revitalized. And that was always a strange experience for me, because I would come home feeling great. When I would have a horrible day, I would ask God for help. The next day I would feel better. I could rely on him. Catherine will remember my worst day. It was in the morning. I was getting ready to go into the office. And try as I might, I couldn't button my pants. My fingers weren't sensitive enough to do a simple task like buttoning my pants. I came out into the kitchen crying, totally defeated. There were a couple of times when I hit a wall. I really didn't know if I could go on. And Catherine got me through those times. She would get me back on track somehow. There was one more ingredient to my healing that I only realized when I was writing this sermon. We all know that God is love. Well, during the entire chemotherapy experience, I kept myself surrounded by love. Anyone or any experience that was <coughs> negative was avoided. 
Catherine helped me to say no to invitations. So in addition to the infusion of chemotherapy, I had the infusion of love. Finally, I finally got upset with my oncologist. Because he was always telling me what the statistics were, and what the risks were, <coughs> and it might not work, and this, that, and the other. And I finally told him, stop it. I do not want to hear this anymore. i got to stay positive. I need to keep thinking in a particular way. And I need you to get on board with that. The results, the hormone treatment was effective almost immediately. The measure of cancer they used dropped to an undetectable level by Christmas. The chemo ended a year ago. I received my last hormone shot this month. I am told that I have been cancer undetectable for 17 months. I believe the cancer is behind me. I still won't have complete sensitivity returning to my fingertips. I still get hot flashes. I have some permanent hearing losses thanks to the chemo. And I would really appreciate getting eyebrows back. <laughs> Yet, I also have a new peacefulness about me that is indescribable. I get bemused with clients that tell me they are spiritual, that they are warriors. The two seem totally inconsistent with me now. I keep sacred my meditation every day. I have confidence that if I need strength, I know where to get it. I learned that the more I surrender my will and acknowledge having no power, the more power I experience. I am exceedingly grateful to God, and I thank God over and over. Then one night, I heard a little voice. Was, uh, I get these little voices once in a while. <laughs> God, said, God said, I help you, and that's what I'm supposed to do, and you're supposed to give thanks by glorifying my name. Well, I went to Julia, and I told her what I experienced, and I told her finally how I had surrendered my will to God before the Christmas, and I told her about the little voice asking me to glorify God. I admitted that I didn't have a clue how to glorify God, and she suggested one way to do it would be to do a sermon. Well, that's how I got here. So would you like more power in your life? First, let him take over. Every day, let him have a little bit more control of your life. Let go of the reins. Start every day by saying, this is the day the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And finish each day by saying, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. I would ask you to repeat with me the invocation that, was, that we read before. With God's help, I have heard strength and energy. I have heard health. I have heard vigor and vitality. I have heard within me the free creative power of God, my Creator. I have heard God's healing forces, renewing and revitalizing 